Growing up, I had dreams and aspirations, but always felt like the kid that didn't fit in. For the most part, I wasn't a bad kid, but when I made the transition into adulthood, I turned to the streets for guidance. This led to getting locked up in juvenile hall, doing time in CYA, and eventually a 120 month sentence in federal prison. I had a lot of time to think and reflect during my federal sentence. So I share with you what I learned, hoping I can positively influence someone else's life with Prison Talk. What up? Big Herc 916. Getting down with another Prison Talk. Hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. Go to FreshOutSeries.com, pick you up some merch. Wash your stinking ass if you ain't washed it yet. And um, yeah, man, let's get into it. Critical race theory. You got people arguing that black history is being ignored in the public schools, that, you know, we're being um, undermined with our heritage and that it should be emphasized that because of the color of your skin is why you don't have certain opportunities and because of the powerful white man and his enslaving of black culture is why we're in the position we're in and we should not entertain certain things because of the American institution. I don't think we should be teaching white privilege in, in the classroom. Bro, real talk though, like brother to brother, teaching white privilege does not inherently mean black people are less. Like that's a great conversation for you to have with your child. But I don't think that taxpayer funded hatred should be something that we allow in our schools. Okay. For black children to sit in a classroom and be told that because of the color of your skin, well, it doesn't matter how hard you try, you're really not going to go that far because the society hates you and then you have all these structural barriers preventing your success. That is also wrong. That is not lessons of hope. That is not lessons of opportunity. And I think that is what schools should be about. You can't create the next generation of leaders if they can, are never capable of seeing themselves as leaders, right? And, you know, when I was going to school, I remember when they got to Abraham Lincoln and freeing the slaves. And I was the only black kid in a predominantly all white school. The school had close to probably 2000 kids and there were maybe four black kids. And I used to feel some kind of way, but I never felt like the white kids there were better than me. And when I would ask my mom certain things, she would never say, oh, it's because of white people that we can't have this or, you know, the, the white um, forefathers kept us blacks down. She never said that, man. I was never surrounded by anybody in my family that taught me that because of the color of my skin that I wouldn't get ahead in life. Now, it's fine. Teach certain inst institutional uh, history facts as far as let's get all the way into it that hey there were blacks here before Christopher Columbus there were blacks that were native that have been stripped and the ones who we call the Indians now are the, only what they actually legally uh, consider to be Native American but there were also Native American blacks there were blacks in Mexico that spoke Spanish there were black slave owners yes there's a woman, um, I don't know her name off the top of my head, but um, she was um, a very uh, wealthy black slave owner. You know, I went ahead and looked it up for you guys because I want you guys to uh, go ahead. You can Google the same stuff I'm Googling. Ten black slave owners that will tear apart historical perception. Justice Angel. Men and women of color owning slaves was not so uncommon even in 18th century South Carolina. However, in most cases, they would own just one, two, or three slaves, often family members, which is what makes this case Justice Angel so notable. In 1830s, Colerton County, the part of the state where Charleston now lies, he was deemed a slave magnet. Not only did he own dozens of slaves himself, he also traded in them, earning himself a fortune at the expense of other more unfortunate souls. As with so many cases of freedmen who made their fortune, almost nothing is known about Angel's early years. 
where he came from, how long he lived as a slave, and how and when he earned his freedom have all been lost to history. What is known, however, is that by 1830, Angel was working with his partner, a certain mistress, El Hori, in the slave business. Between them, they owned 168 slaves, putting them to work on their plantation and earning themselves huge amounts of money in the process. What also made Angel and his partner notable was their treatment of their slaves. Quite simply, just because Angel was a person of color himself didn't mean he would treat his slaves kindly. Far from it, in fact. While there is no evidence to suggest that neither Angel nor Hori were any crueler than white plantation owners of the time, they definitely weren't any nicer. For them, slaves were nothing more than labor or possessions. Records show that they used their privilege, privileges as owners to punish any slave that tried to escape. What's more, they would buy and sell slaves purely for profit with no concern for their well-being. Undoubtedly, families would have been split up and some slaves would have been sold on to even crueler masters. Marie Ther Therese Matoyer. Marie Therese Matoyer was born in slavery but died a rich woman, and a rich woman with slaves for her own to boot. In fact, at the turn of the 18th century, Marie Therese was one of the richest ladies in Louisiana. As a free lady, she was an astute entrepreneur as well as social climber. Moreover, she was a Christian minded and worked to improve the society she lived in, even if she didn't make use of slave labor. So how did this lady born to slaves earn her freedom and then her fortune? The answer is simply a twist of fate. Maria Therese was actually born a uh, coin coin with no given surname and Louisiana French outposts of Nachitokos. While she was born in slavery, she did have some education as a child being trained in nursing and then pharmacy skills that she would be able to put to good use later in life. Records show that she had children young, five children to be precise, though who their father was is not known. Um, what is known that in 1765, Corn Coin's mistress decided to lend her to a man called Claude Thomas Pierre Matoyer. It was a decision that would change the lives of both the slave and the young French merchant. Matoyer fell in love with his new slave and ordered us to stay together. He purchased her as well as her children. She took a French name and when they had six children of their own, he purchased their freedom too. But after many happy years together, Claude Thomas fell for another woman, divorced Marie Therese and returned to France. He left behind all his possessions. However, Marie Therese was a wealthy woman. By 1830, it's estimated that she owned more than 1,000 acres with an estimated 287 slaves working the land. As with many plantation owners, Marie Therese was tough with her slaves. She was obviously a shrewd businesswoman since she got steadily richer, suggesting she had little time for sentimentality. Then we have Antoine Dupacle. 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 At the time of his death in 1887, Antoine Dupacle, Dupacle was a wealthy man, excuse me if I mispronounce the name, a very wealthy man. In fact, he was widely regarded as one of the richest men in the South, richer even than his white neighbors. According to historians, estimates he was worth around 265000 around 200 times the average annual income. As well as his land, he owned significant numbers of slaves. Moreover, he was well-respected in society, not just because of his riches. Dupacle was in many ways a true Southern gentleman, smart, well-dressed, and debonair. The Duclay family had come a long way in a very short space. Um, unlike many slave owners of color of the period, Anton Duclay was born to free parents. He was born in 1810, son of a part owner of a sugar plantation close to Baton Rouge. When his father died, his mother moved to New Orleans with Anton's younger brother and sisters. Anton, meanwhile, took over the plantation. As well as the land, he also inherited around 70 slaves. In 1834, the other partners in the plantation sold up, and the whole business was split equally among Anton and his siblings. Um, Andrew Dunniford, as a physician and a man of science, surely Andrew Dunniford should have seen that all men were born equally. Evidently not. For as well as being a doctor, Dunford, a man of color himself, was a plantation owner. 
From the 1820s onward, he grew his sugar business across the state of Louisiana, ultimately becoming the owner of not just large amounts of land, but dozens of slaves too. Furthermore, the history books show that he regarded the system of slavery as just and indeed even the American way of doing things. Born in 1800 in New Orleans, Dunford was the son of an Englishman and a free woman of color. Thanks to the Louisiana Purchase, he automatically became a citizen of the United States and earned a fine education, being fluent in both French and English. Then we have John Carew Stanley. Like many slave children born on plantations, John Carew Stanley parentage was questionable. According to most accounts, he was born in March of 1795, the son of John Wright, a prominent merchant from New Bern, North Carolina. His mother was an enslaved African woman working on a nearby plantation. As such, the child their affair produced was born enslaved. Fortunately for him, however, the owners of the plantation a couple called Alexander and Louisa Stewart were far kinder to their slaves than the majority of their peers. It was due to this benevolence that Stanley was able to learn a trade while being enslaved. Along the side of standard education, young John learned to become a barber. What's more, he was able to work part-time cutting hair while not busy on a plantation. After a few years, he saved up a sum of money, earned himself a reputation in the local community as an honest, hard-working young man. So in 1798, when he turned 21, he was able to buy his own freedom backed by supporters of the Stuarts. In 1801, Stanley not only purchased his wife, Kitty, but two slave children as well. This meant he and Kitty could be legally married according to the state of North Carolina. Then with his brother's freedom purchase, he focused his attention on moving out of cutting hair and to making some serious money. With two of his own slaves taking care of his barbershop, Stanley bought some land just outside New Bern. Over time, he expanded his operation significantly, and at a peak, he had an estimated 163 slaves under his control and uh, you know there's more but just giving you guys a little game man because they don't they don't want to teach us the full spectrum of how all this shit came about you know we, we, we want to keep pushing that all blacks were victims and there were a lot of blacks who flipped the script and may have came from slavery, but turn around and own slave them damn selves. It's no different than you have people who have been able to accomplish a certain amount of success, and they basically take part in um, cheap labor, you know, goods at low prices. I mean, it's, it's capitalism. And I know people hate to look at it like that, but slavery could not have existed if the Africans who were able to go into the actual land didn't bring the other Africans to the coast. So <laughs> there's a lot of things, if you could actually go back in a time machine and see this shit, but one thing I consider ingenious is those who came up with the history books who are the ones who dictate what's considered the, the history of this country had an agenda and enslaving not only means having chains or shackles on you it also means mentally and a lot of blacks are mentally enslaved a lot of people in society are mentally enslaved they are so caught up and have not decided to do any research on their own or study to figure out what is truth they just take what somebody tells them as, um, as fact. And I've always been the type of person, you can't just tell me anything. I'm gonna go do my own research. And to be honest, when I, when I got to the pen and I started really researching and OGs in there started giving me books on everything from religion, um, history, um, uh, economics, the law, man, it, it opened my eyes and I realized that I had been sold a lie my whole life. I would have never robbed a bank had I knew my true value, had I understood the dynamics of uh, um, de facto and de jure law, Black's Law Dictionary, the Congressional Acts. Had I really had uh, 
a greater understanding for the law and its particulars, I probably would have been a lawyer, man, because I realized that the pen is mightier than any pistol, any gangster bullshit that you can try to pretend to be or act out. A lawyer, just through the use of words, can shut down a courtroom. So just like a lawyer can shut down a courtroom with the use of words, you can change your perception of the world with the right education. And I wouldn't consider the public schools to be the place where you're gonna get the right education anyways. They're not teaching you how to do your taxes. They're not teaching you how to set up an LLC, how to incorporate so that you can do tax write-offs. They're not teaching you how to balance your checkbook. They're not teaching you about cryptocurrency. They're not teaching you about foreign currency, um, about day trading. They're not teaching you really anything but how to be a robot, a slave bot. So. As far as critical race theory, you know, they can stick that shit up their ass, man. You know, I, I think it's a waste of time. And as a parent, if you really, you know, if you're if you're a, a black parent and you really want to give your kids some game, go get them some real books on some stuff, man, and uh, really lace them up on some truths so that they can feel like they're somebody of importance rather than some subpar. Uh, individual who's at a disadvantage because that's what the system is designed to do that's why they have you know charter schools magna schools and these uh private schools that cost so much because they want to price you out of a good conversation of a, of a good friendship you realize more than education is having the right people around you who can lace you up on real game can be a game changer you got people with master's degree right now managing Starbucks, and you got people who don't even have a high, high school education that are multimillionaires. And I tell you, once you, you, you get a, a certain level of financial status, it doesn't matter if you're Chinese, you're Japanese, you're, you're, you're German, you're African, you're, um, you're uh, uh, a, a black, what's considered a black American. Man, look, the money's gonna spend the same. You're gonna be able to make deals. and if you're concerned about somebody judging you on the color of the skin, hey man, get your get your white partner. Here, get your European partner to represent you in your company. I know white guys who don't even go to their own meetings because they're all tatted up, and, and they they know that they're going to be judged on their per, per, uh, their perception of appearance. So they have somebody show up for them that represents their company. So white people do it too. You guys got to quit acting like you can't get the game. The game is there, man. Would quit your crying. Quit your crying and use your, your, your intelligence to maneuver on the chess board properly. The chess game is so much bigger than sitting here talking about critical race theory. Man, look, man, critical race theory, if you're going to let that be the, the deciding factor on whether or not your child gets a great, great education, you, you are really pathetic, man, <laughs> because you, you ain't doing nothing at home. You ain't buying no books. You ain't you ain't doing no no one on ones with your child. You're just letting the school do everything. Man, you are really hurting. <laughs> you, you, you know, I guess they don't do it now, but I know back in the day, you, counting only on the school to give you your game, you were bound to lose, man. So step your game up, man. And, um, you know, Tell these cats, man, you know, who are crying or whining or pushing or worried about critical race theory changing the game. It ain't going to change shit. All they're trying to do is divide you. And I'm telling you right now, it's the cat who may be your white partner, maybe your, your, your brown partner, maybe your, your, um, your uh, Indian partner, whoever it is, they're going to be the ones who are who going to open the door. But if they think that you can't talk to them because you don't like them because of now the hate, you're missing out on world opportunity. I'm going a, I'm to a keep... Um, hollering at everybody. I ain't gonna live with myself to think that, oh man, all these people to blame for my situation? Come on, man. Man, shit. I can't blame no no white dude for telling me to rob a bank for for, for what's going on. Now that I have, it, it's, you know what? I would say if a lot of the parents out there took the time to really push the envelope, and there's a bunch of parents out there who are, 
who are really doing it on a big way and they're quiet about it because they don't want they don't want to even be in, in the limelight man shit this whole thing would flip but a lot of parents don't care anyways they they raise them babies they raise them babies and they're they're letting whatever the school do do what they do anyway so big Herc 916 getting down fresh out Hello, my name is Big Kirk 916 and I'm from the Wash Your Ass Committee and I'm here to help you clean your booty hole. So I have some scents here that I would like to share with you. I have um, Festival, I have Butt Naked Scrub, I have some Oatmeal Milk and Honey, I have uh, Jamaican Me Crazy Festival. Um, you can take a pick from one of these, these scents and wash your ass make your body feel better about itself, get rid of the funk. And I would like to make sure I can give you a good deal. So let me know. Go to FreshOutSeries.com, pick you up a bar, and please wash Stop your ass. walking around with a crusty butt, smelly ball sack, and a funky hoo-ha. Big Herc said wash that ass. Pick you up a t-shirt at FreshOutSeries.com.